Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Methods for Teaching Organic Farming and Gardening. So we are very excited to welcome an audience of around 200 educators and others from around the U.S. today. So in the presentation today, we'll be hearing from Christophe Bernal, an educator at the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, which we refer to as CASTA, and is located at the University of California, Santa Cruz. My name is Jan Perez. I'm a specialist in research and education at CASTIS. We're also here with Jesse Beckett Parr and Megan Donovan from California Certified Organic Farmers, referred to as CCOF, and they'll be managing the technical aspects of the webinar today. So this webinar is brought to you by CASTIS and CCOF, and it is also funded by Western Fair. So how this webinar will work, today's session will last for an hour, and we plan to have time for questions both during and at the end of the presentation. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. If you can hear my voice, that's a very good sign. You should also be able to see the presentation at this point. If you're having any technical difficulties, please call CCOF at the following number, 831-423-2263. Again, that's 831-423-2263 two, two, six, three, and press zero for the operator. So we're looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on their screen, and the control panel at the right. Within that control panel is how you can participate in today's event, so let's look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close your control panel. From the View menu, you can also set the control panel to not go into auto-hide uh, when it's inactive if you prefer to always keep it open. The audio pane provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar via mic and speakers. Click Audio Setup to select your computer speaker or headset devices. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting Use Telephone, and the dial-in information will be displayed. You may send your questions through the question pane. Simply type in your question and click send. Again, we'll take your questions throughout the presentation. If you need to get our attention for some reason, go ahead and use the raising your hand feature. The final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email link um, to view it on your computer at a later point. So let's do a test to make sure you know where the question pane is. So please tell us where you're calling in from today and what kind of organization you work with. And we'll revisit these questions later on. Before we get started, I'll share a bit about our presenter, Christoph. So Christoph Bernau is the Castus Farm Garden Manager. He was a member of the 1994 Apprenticeship in Ecological Horticulture class and has been a lead apprenticeship instructor since 1999. He has extensive experience in nursery management, propagation, vegetable, and specialty cut flower production. He is especially interested in high nutrition crops, grain production, the cultivation of specialty fruits, building an equitable food system, and creating a learning environment where everyone can thrive. He holds a BA in Asian History from Reed College and an MA in Equity and Social Justice in Adult Education from San Francisco State University. So with that, I'll hand this over to Christoph. Welcome, everyone. I look forward to sharing with you some of our practices and strategies that we have developed and employ at the Farm and Garden, many of th which are probably things you'll be familiar with. Um, but hopefully, as you hear these pieces together, you'll see how they really work together to support a, a complete package for really trying to create an uh, educational experience on farms and in gardens. Um, I will go through kind of the sequence of what we're going to talk about in just a moment, um, but I wanted to definitely say as you look at the outline on this next image here, um, that if you have questions that come up in the midst of or kind of relevant to any of these subjects as we're going through, then I'd be happy to try to answer them as we go, but as Jan said, there'll be time at the end as well. And this outline basically came from feedback we got from the last webinar we did, um, and so really trying to build on, uh, for those of you who are returning, building on your prior experience with us and taking things a little bit further. Um, will you go back to the previous slide, actually, um, to the 
do the over the aerial shot. Thank you. So I just wanted to give you kind of a use this as a backdrop for a brief um, history to CASFIS, the Center for Agroecology. Um, this is an aerial shot. You can see we are positioned here in Santa Cruz, right on the coast, looking out towards the Pacific Ocean and the Monterey Bay. Um, the campus itself is an extensive and fairly open campus, and we're in the bottom portion of the campus. And what you see here is about a 33-acre site, although not all of the farm is. There's a couple pieces cut off in this image, and then we have an additional three and a half acre site in the heart of the campus. Um, the Center for Agroecology started essentially as something called the Farm Project in 1967, and the Garden Project and then the Farm Project, um, and was a reaction to the, all of the social movement and social change at the time, and then was also created um, and sponsored by early administrators at the university to really give students an outlet um, to be outdoors and explore um, the process of engaging with food, plants, and ecology. Um, since that time, we have grown and expanded both our sort of land footprint as well as the breadth of audiences that we try to serve. Um, and we presently are serving many, many different audiences. One of the main audiences on this site and in the upper garden is adult learners that are in the um, apprenticeship program, which is a six-month intensive program in all aspects of small-scale organic production. There are also undergraduates who come through the farm, both through internships and practicum-based classes and lab classes um, on the farm, and both the faculty as well as um, farm staff are responsible for working with the students in those contexts. Um, we also um, work with and support a program called Food What, which is a youth empowerment program, and they work side by side with the apprentices and the interns as part of their time on farm. And then we have a range of adult classes or community-based classes as well through a local group called, a support group called Friends of the Farm and Garden. Uh, so that's just to give you a little background and context on place. We've been certified organic by CCOS since basically since the inception, and we grow and market somewhere on the order of about $180,000 to $200,000 worth of produce a year through a roadside stand at the base of the campus, a CSA, the dining halls on campus, um, and then a very small amount of wholesale to um, specialty restaurants and florists and such and some special events on, on campus. And all of the food is grown by students um, in these different audiences, and then the, the permanent staff. Go to the next slide. Um, so just to give you a little bit of sense of where we're heading, talk a little bit about background and history. Um, I'm going to just briefly touch on the two curriculum manuals that were more the central focus of the previous webinar that we did. Um, and then we're going to dive into areas around inclusion, access, how do we really create a learning environment um, where everybody who participates can really thrive and build their capacity? Um, we'll talk about a range of experiential ed concepts and practices, ways in which we think about learning and creating this learning environment um, to build capacity. Um, Part of it is building capacity in the short term here and now on site, and then part of it is really this idea of um, setting people up to be successful and inspired lifelong learners, and then how we take this information out into the world and bring it back to our own communities and such. That's especially the transferability part. Um, and then finally, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this idea of balancing production and education, and I'll give you my bias right from the start, which is that we are really trying to grow farmers, gardeners, educators, and activists as our, as our primary crop, and then that's done in a production context. Um, but really, the people are the, the key thing that we're working on growing. So just to give you a quick overview of the two curriculum manuals, um, the first one, the one on the left, Teaching Organic Farming and Gardening, is a pretty extensive tome really focusing on agricultural skills and concepts 
um, using both sort of scientific foundations as well as the practical sort of translated through the fingertip skills that um, growers, regardless of scale, would need. It has a variety of, in most all of the units, um, lecture outlines, demonstration outlines, um, exercises for students to pursue, um, resources, whether those are print or web-based resources for further study. Um, and then there is a unit on soil science and how soil science is applied to organic management of soils. Um, a social issues section, really trying to contextualize our efforts to grow food in the larger food system and who does and does not have access to food and why. Um, and then movements and, and opportunities to change the system that we're currently in. And then the, the manual on the right um, is really about direct marketing strategies um, and similar organizational method, but looking at CSA, farmers markets, farm to institution, and a variety of other um, direct outlets. Um, and just for folks who don't know, these manuals are designed both for the student as the kind of content-based resources, as well as for educators, facilitators, teachers, um, providing templates on both the broader picture as well as specific subjects, providing templates that you can adapt to your context, to your setting and audience. Um, so, and both of those manuals are available um, in print for sale, but they are, thanks to some generous support, we were able to put them both online and are entirely downloadable as PDF units, um, either individual units or the entire manual. So that's a little background on that. Um, so I wanted to start in terms of practices, just thinking about um, how do we create a how do we create an environment where everybody who comes to you, everybody who engages in your space, is really able to thrive, and what you know what that means and how that will look will obviously be different from individual to individual. But some of the things that we try to do. Um, it's specifically in the apprenticeship, but it's also very much part of the larger university culture as well, um, is we start very early on with um, trainings with skilled facilitators around anti-oppression, really understanding things around institutional racism, power and privilege in society, and how these things then impact people's access to knowledge, access to power, and fundamentally access to food. Um, we do communication skills workshops because there's so many different learners, different styles, different backgrounds trying to build shared language so people can really work, live, and learn together. Um, and then also some effort to try to take things out of silos, take the environmental movements, take social movements, um, take practical skills training and really try to link them all together as part of a, a larger um, an integrated package of, of thoughts and ways of being. Um, and so in this, a big part of what we're going to, we do in each of our classes and as we're going through things, we're really trying to keep bringing you know, production practices back to, well, how does, how does this relate to labor? How does this relate to immigration issues? How does this relate to larger economic structures? Um, and then how you as a grower or activists may help to influence change in the in the future as we try to build a, a different food system. Um, some things perhaps coming out of um, popular education models as well. Thing we really try to focus on and highlight multiple sources of knowledge and expertise, not that the the presenter, me or any of the other instructors, outside instructors that we are the sole fonts of knowledge, but that really everybody who comes to the program brings knowledge, experience, background um, from, from their lives that, that can be shared and, and benefit others in the group. Um, and then part of this, and I've sort of already mentioned this, but we have regular conversations in the sites in particular trying to reflect on things like, well, what did you see in terms of labor practices? Did the farm workers have access to food? Did they have health care and benefits opportunity for advancement? Um, 
and and who, who are the leaders, who are the workers, things that are going to help people really see kind of bigger picture structures in society and how um, they may be able to create different uh, different situation for in their future, whether that's in a nonprofit context or a school garden context or um, on a production farm. Um, and then as I mentioned, labor is a, an ongoing threat and obviously a huge issue um, throughout ag education. So while we're really we're rooted and started as a practical and skills-based program, we really try to take the skills and concepts and contextualize them in our society. Um, and I should just mention this, the image on that uh, page there too, that's actually um, from a student garden on campus, but I, th I would say that that's kind of as a starting point, something that I personally think is a, is a welcome invitation for everybody to come feel safe, feel like they can really be engaged in the, in the environment that we're, we're working in. A um, um, couple of just sort of other broad threads or topics in this regard as well. Um, so throughout our growing practices, we're trying to connect to the history of the crops. Where do these plants come from? How did they move around the world? How are they being used from, from the cultures that they came from as well as the cultures that the plants have moved to, whether that was through colonialism or through trade routes and such. Um, and then we make an ad attempt, while we can't grow everything at all times, to really have a range of crops from, especially for the audiences, the people who come to the program that we know are going to be there, um, foods that have cultural relevance that make sense to people that their families grew up cooking and eating and so forth. Um, and then really bringing kind of the story of these plants and how they get how they got here and and how they're evolving and adapting in cultures as well. Um, and sort of back to the um, popular education idea too. A part of what we're attempting to do is really try to hear from you know both there's the sort of the ex knowledge experts and so forth who are the leaders, facilitators, presenters but always going back to trying to hear other folks' experience, and especially when you consider that we are in a um, coastal Mediterranean climate in California. Most of the undergraduates come from California, but most of the adults in the apprenticeship program come from other climates, from other parts of the country and the world. Um, different growing seasons, different pest and disease issues, um, different cultural influences and so we're always trying to hear from them and bring their knowledge to the table so that we all learn together um, and get a little bit better, broader sense of how practices are carried out and reinterpreted or, or adapted in different locations. Um, and this is actually an image from Pi Ranch who is a sort of partner organization of ours just up the coast who um, is really focused on food and farming education with a justice and equity lens. Um, and they work in particular with youth from San Francisco, um, but a variety of audiences. And they do um, farmer training, um, beginning farmer training on site as well. And they are, I would say, are an example um, of an organization really working both through their leadership and through their participants and audiences to really try to integrate this idea of a social change agenda um, in a real applied education setting. Why are these skills relevant? Why are these skills and knowledge that um, should be broadly shared and disseminated and that there's, as I said, broad sources of, of content to, um, to include. So, um, and this is in a way, if you, a little hard to read <laughs> the exact image there, but this is um, kind of part of what we're always thinking about at, the, at CASAS as well. Um, and especially if you see, so here you have farmer training, you have food education, um, you have partnerships with local organizations, um, and then kind of an organizational culture that really 
um, values anti-oppression um, and social and racial justice at the, at the heart of their work. And, and that's certainly at the heart of our mission and part of what we're always trying to work towards. But it is a work in progress. Um, so moving into, I just want to kind of, this will go, going back a little bit to our audiences here. Um, if you look in the top right corner of the image there, you have the site managers, and that is our, what we refer to as sort of our perennial staff. Um, we also have a perennial assistant managers, um, and we are really both farmers, gardeners, and educators at simultaneously. We're both producers of crops as well as hopefully producers of knowledge and experience. Um, and then we have what are re we refer to as second year or advanced apprentices. Those are folks who have gone through the second year program, um, or through, excuse me, through our first year program, and then have developed um, ex more extensive skills and experience, both from their prior experience and with us. Um, and they really serve as leaders and facilitators and teachers for all the audiences we work with, both the first year apprentices, the student staff, because we have some undergraduates who have gone through the internship cycle and then work as paid staff, um, then interns who are typically there um, somewhere on the order of 9 to 12 hours a week, um, and then undergraduates in, in classes who might only be there once a week for a couple of hours. Um, but with these sort of layered audiences, there's something that in learning theory there's something referred to as zone, uh, zones of proximal development. Somebody with a certain level of experience working side by side with somebody with a little bit more advanced experience working with the next level of experience um, so that you can always be kind of looking forward and seeing who's your role model. If I work hard on this, if I focus on this, where do I get to next? Um, all the way from very, at the very beginner state um, to people who have been working in this field for, for many, many years. Um, one of the um, key things that we really think about, too, is this um, idea of I do, we do, you do as one of the kind of modes of learning and instruction. Um, some people have called this sort of our mantra, and I think to a certain extent that that is true. Um, I'll come back to classroom-based education in a, in a bit, but for many of our skills-based things, you would hear a presentation from somebody with more advanced experience, um, presentation and demonstration on a particular activity and, and, and contextualizing how and why this might be important and how it might play out elsewhere. Um, then um, you would work side by side, and I think you can go to the next slide actually, work side by side um, with somebody with greater level of experience than you. In um, education, this is sometimes referred to as scaffolded learning or scaffolded activity where um, you have support, you have somebody with more knowledge and experience to help support you through a process of skills acquisition. Um, so that's the I do and the we do. And then the next tier in that sequence is what we refer to as the you do, where the staff, both perennial and biennial or assistant staff, step back, um, create the context for people to be able to carry um, a project from start to finish, um, but where people are really building their capacity, being able to think fluidly back and forth between sort of more science and theory and content to mastery through the fingers, through your muscle memory, um, building comfort and familiarity with the process um, and building competency along the way. Um, mastery is a term, I have it in quotes there because it's a term that is a little bit of an elusive one. I've been doing this work for 20 plus years and um, I don't really actually feel like a master of very much. I feel like I have a good level of experience on lots of fronts, but a master of anything, and that, to me at least, that's an elusive idea. But it, it's all about continued building of skills and, and capacity. Um, the idea of demonstrations I mentioned, we use demonstrations all the time. Um, both in a classroom setting and, as these images suggest here, out in the field. 
in the top right, our former production manager, Liz Malazzo, is giving a group of apprentices um, a training on, on harvest of le a lettuce crop um, and both thinking kind of all aspects, crop maturity, how did we get to this point, um, what are we going to do in terms of post-harvest handling, what are cleaning steps that are required to bring that crop to market, food safety issues, um, kind of all being woven together in the process of showing here's how we cut and move through a stand of lettuce and then get it to the get it to the consumer. Um, you can kind of see in both of these and especially in the image in the bottom left, um, we try to tailor demonstrations to relatively small groups so that um, people can really be right. Everybody has a front row seat. Everybody can see what's going on, has their space for um, people to be able to ask questions and clarify things that are going on. Um, a lot of times in much bigger groups, people hang back, people are kind of lost in the shuffle, and also it's harder to have your voice heard when it's too, too large a group. Um, next. Um, and just I sort of mentioned this, but we really use these demonstrations in virtually all contexts. Um, here, Orn Martin is giving a lesson on fruit tree pruning to a public audience, to a weekend workshop audience, uh, mostly home gardeners, um, but really using the, the standing tree that's a few years old um, and being able to illustrate uh, physiology of the tree, responses to pruning cuts. Um, and with the apprentice group, and the, we would take that to the next level of giving people the opportunity to think about and start to tape off the trees to determine where um, they would make cuts, and then with a little bit of check-in with staff, then actually going out and doing the, doing the pruning work. Similarly, tractor demonstrations and such, um, so that people really see how the implements work and their impact on the crops and the soil. Um, and all of this is about using three-dimensional space, visual stimulation, words, actions, um, to integrate skills and concepts together. And it comes back to another kind of learning theory idea around sort of multiple modalities. But we very definitely find that the working um, in the three-dimensional realm, both seeing and watching, but then actually doing is how um, I, how knowledge and, and practice is really cemented. Um, more demos. Um, just to give you a little sense of what's going on here. So I, uh, it says sensory stimulation, tactile connection. So in the left image there, there's a group of undergraduate students who are doing two things simultaneously. They're assessing, doing a uh, hands-on um, what we would call qualitative assessment of soil moisture um, because soil moisture is such a critical thing when you think about both cultivation, whether that's hand scale or tractor scale cultivation, being able to really understand the um, importance of and accurately assess soil moisture to, so that you can be stewarding your soil um, in a beneficial way. But then also, this at the same time, this same exercise is looking at soil structure and the impacts of cultivation and organic matter inputs and such. Um, on the right is part of a soil class, um, actually in this particular session, on a class on structure and texture, and they're digging a soil pit. And again, you can see the group is up close and personal, so we can see our soil horizons in our on our site and how that's changed. In this case, this is in a um, right on the edge of a cultivated field, and we've got a similar pit in the field. So you've got the students are able to see the contrast between. Um, an area that's had intensive cultivation and stewardship and management, and then an area that is unmanaged um, and see the impact. So we've got a question, and I also thought I'd just really quickly get back to you all um, with who else we have on the call with us. So as well as the California folks, we've got people from Oregon, Hawaii, Fresno, and Detroit. We have a fair amount of teachers students, farmers, and a whole lot of folks affiliated with the university. So welcome, everybody. And now I'll ask a quick question, because it seems somewhat related to how we manage all of this at CASFIS, is how many staff, both part-time and full-time, <laughs> are at CASFIS? So I'm assuming part of that, what's interesting is the, you know, what makes the farm run, and then there's a few other of us at CASFIS that aren't related to the apprenticeship. 
Yeah, so it so Texas staff overall is quite a bit larger, um, but in terms of kind of the applied or hands-on education, um, there are four permanent uh, staff who work both managing the sites and then work side by side with the students, um, both in the gardens, greenhouses and fields, orchards, as well as lead many of our classes, though a lot of the classes are also taught by outside instructors. Then we have currently um, two permanent assistant staff and actually are hoping to expand that. Um, typically we have seven, five to seven second year apprentices who are ongoing learners but who are a, a key part of the success of our operations. Um, and then we have about four people who are involved on a, a variety of administrative levels, three, actually three full-time equivalents on a variety of administrative levels who really do an incredible amount of work to orchestrate and uh, create the whole program, but who don't sort of get the, the, the aren't out there on a day-to-day -day basis working side by side with people, but without them we couldn't, we couldn't do everything that we're doing with the apprentices and the undergraduates. Um, we have normally about 39 apprentices, but then broken down into smaller groups for that six month training. Um, when we're working with interns, we'll usually have as many as 10 per site, the sites being the Chadwick Garden, the Upper Garden, the Tractor Cultivated Fields, and on the, the lower site that you saw the aerial image of, and then the handwork gardens that are down below. So as many as 25 to 30 interns at any one time, and then um, the one day a week environmental studies practicum classes, those are often 25 to 30 students. A lot of pulsing in and out though, um, and we'll talk more about the balance of production and education. We don't actually have that many people constantly working on site, constantly engaged on site, yes, but not necessarily taking care of everything. Did that answer all of that question? Uh, from what I can tell, but if, there's, <laughs> if somebody needs some clarity, please uh, feel free to type another question in. We'd love to hear from you. So again, any other questions coming in, uh, we'll take a pause in a few minutes. Great. Um, so just to, um, moving on a little bit, we also use kind of what I would call sort of a walking classroom or mobile classroom via, via field walks and garden walks. Um, to look at the crops, to look at successes and failures, to look at challenges that we're having as well as um, crops that are particularly thriving, um, and then try to problem solve, troubleshoot, um, look at, you know, when we have, a, let's say, pest or disease damage, then talk about life cycle, see if we can do some identification work, figure out what resources are out in our community to figure out who that pest or disease problem might be, what it might be, um, think about what other crops might be vulnerable and, and how that's going to impact any um, future prevention strategies or intervention strategies that we might use. Um, but really trying to have people fully engaged in the site um, and responding to people's questions and inquiries and observations in the moment um, is a really key part of um, how we kind of think of this kind of um, flowing or moving classroom. Um, mentioned this idea too of hands-on exercises and activities that um, really learning by doing. We can read all the books that we want, we can listen to all the lectures that we can possibly deliver, or a student can do so, um, but so much of growing crops, stewarding soil fertility management, um, being an engaged citizen is really about learning by doing. So um, from we have a variety of roles and responsibilities that we give people, but ultimately people are really involved in growing all of the crops that we produce from seed to seed, all of the annuals from sowing the seeds, managing the seedlings in the greenhouse, or if they're direct sown, um, caring for them in the ground, transplanting, um, any ma maintenance and upkeep and trellising and so forth that might have to happen with a particular crop, harvest and post-harvest handling, 
pests and disease strategies, and then in some instances, seed saving as well. Um, and then this is also in the bottom of this slide, I've written connectivity. One of the things that we really try to keep referring back to is how does any individual practice or concept, how does it relate to the whole? How does how do my irrigation strategies then relate to the bigger picture of the water cycle? But how are my irrigation strategies going to impact pests and disease um, issues in my crop? How is it going to have an influence on soil fertility and possible leaching of nutrients or conservation of nutrients, impact on soil structure and surface? Uh, surface quality of the soil. Um, always trying to not not keep things isolated, but rather connected to to the whole. Um, and yeah, so through a variety of methods, we um, really work on lots and lots of applied experience, um, and we have um, opportunities. Uh, on many, 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 many fronts. One of the, well, I guess the areas where I would say um, kind of responsibility and ownership come up the most is through what we sometimes call um, sub-rotations where our learners, our audiences are in, with the same idea of I do, we do, you do and sort of scaffolded support. Um, our learners are entirely responsible for irrigation um, entirely responsible for the greenhouse management, venting, air circulation, temperature control, watering of the seedlings and such. Um, they're also entirely responsible within our you know, existing structures for marketing and, and distribution of our crops as well. Um, and each of the people in the apprenticeship program has short, usually four weeks where this is their ongoing focus, along with kind of learning and being involved in everything else, they have a more explicit focus in those particular arenas because we found that those are kind of key components for people to really um, to really be learning on, learning and focusing on. Um, and then here's another <laughs> the value of repetition. So. Um, so much uh, farming and gardening re involves a tremendous amount of repetition and, and I think it's very common amongst learners to feel like, oh, okay, I've sown these seeds or I've transplanted these plants, I did it once, I pretty much have got it now. And while certainly you people we feel have gotten something, the more people do things, the more they're able to refine their skill set to build proficiency and efficiency, um, to deepen their understanding of what they're doing, and to make the connections that I was referring about before, um, and then really build these technical skills moving towards mastery. So. All right, we've got a number of questions now uh, related to what we're talking about. Thank you so much, everybody. Glad you're sending them in. Um, the first one I have here is, what connections does CASIS make with formal coursework? Um, that's a great question, and there are two principal avenues where this is happening. Um, one through environmental studies and the agroecology curriculum. Um, faculty are responsible for lecture and the laboratory portion, but the whole, all of the laboratory activities take place on farm. Um, so CAPSA staff and to a certain extent the apprentices and, uh, and even undergraduate students are responsible for planting and care and establishment of uh, trial plots and research plots that then in the classroom um, or in the lab portion of classes people um, are engaged um, a, kind of on a variety of um, a variety of skills and concepts trying to integrate theory and practice. Um, that's one way. There's also um, course list um, for three quarters. UC Santa Cruz is on a quarter system, so um, fall, winter, and spring. Um, there are what are referred to as practicum courses that really are focused on applied skills, but with a, a led by um, led by faculty, um, and they um, the faculty are kind of principally responsible for the 
bigger picture and contextualization, and then the farm staff is responsible for the sort of how does that then how do those skills and concepts play out on on a field scale or on a garden scale? Um, and those are those are the main academic connections. There are many other um, classes on campus that use the farm on a more kind of casual or informal basis. Entomology classes, um, disease um, and pathology classes come and gather samples. We're regularly hosting um, insect collection and so forth. Right now I have some people studying cucumber mosaic virus and unfortunately we have some cucumber mosaic virus that they're sampling from. So in that respect, because we're kind of a living laboratory, we're a resource for many different classes on campus as well. Great. And um, quick one, what department are you located in? I guess that's we're a separate uh, education and research unit on campus that's part of the social sciences division, but we're not within any other academic department per se that we work really collaboratively and Christoph was saying with environmental studies. Yeah, and, and that is in large part because UC Santa Cruz is not a land-grant university, um, so, so we're housed within social sciences. And another question, what degree of leadership do students have? Um, that is a great question, and leadership is something that so I would say is sort of developed or cultivated over time. Um, for undergraduates, it happens by way of taking some of the required courses that then give them exposure to the farm, doing on-farm internships, um, and then we have usually at least two to three positions at a time that we are we refer to as student managers, and they are students who really are have an abiding interest in agriculture, um, and they have an opportunity both to perform the whole gamut of farm tasks as well as lead undergraduates um, in, in um, production practices, harvest and irrigation and such. And that's part of that idea of the kind of zones of proximal development. Um, and then for the apprentices, similarly, they take everybody is deliberately rotated through leadership responsibilities as essentially as crew leaders for irrigation, for greenhouse management, and especially for the marketing for harvesting. Um, harvesting and distribution of all their crops. Great. And another question, do you connect with programs or other opportunities for students or community members off-site? Um, so that's something actually that we at CASFIS do some of, a variety of local and regional partnerships, but it's definitely not our primary mode of engagement. Um, but we, you know, we're certainly involved with many other organizations, but it's kind of a more of a minor rather than major chord. Great. All right. Well, why don't we take a break from the questions now and go back to uh, your topic. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'm just going to maybe flow through a few other things here. So, in addition to, I, I think I mentioned that we have on-farm staff who are the primary educators. Um, but we also bring in a whole gamut of outside speakers um, who both work in the classroom and sort of lecture or panel type setting and um, and then they also um, oftentimes do parts of their class outside as field walks, field demos and so forth. Um, and you know this takes kind of your more traditional or didactic mode in many instances, but very often people are using a variety of modalities whether that's demonstration or dialogue or whatnot in the in the classroom setting as well. We also do a lot of field trips. And this top picture is actually at a, a trip at an equipment yard, um, at a at a sales yard, but we go to working farms, to nonprofit farms, um, education and school garden programs, um, both in the Monterey Bay area as well as the San Francisco Bay area. And then we help the apprentices self-organize to go to field trips further afield on the weekends and so forth. And that's a great way for people to see skills and concepts that we've talked about and how they play out elsewhere um, and how in some cases they're similar, in some cases they're very different. Um, and I mentioned this idea of just this idea of kind of bringing this three-dimensional classroom. So even in the classroom, bringing in plant material, even if we make a big mess in the classroom, giving hands-on things for people to do. And this on the left is a simple example of people um, labeling boxes for wholesale distribution. 
Um, in this case, this image um, is uh, something that was up on a chalkboard in one of our outdoor classrooms. And then we had dug up plant samples with all of these different root types and so forth that people could pass around and see. Um, so you get that so that the, the language, there's so much in agriculture that's about learning a whole new language. Um, and so that the language is reinforced by the visual elements and sort of the tactile elements of the, of the material. Um, the, I mentioned a number of these things already, but we um, certainly work, people have a tremendous amount of opportunity to work independently. Very often they're also working in small groups and really have to collaborate and coordinate and think about how to get things done. They do some things such as group projects like a crop planting exercise, for example, um, where small teams of people put together a crop plan um, at, for marketing and distribution um, as a stepping stone to building their own crop plans in the future. Um, ultimately, though, we found the more opportunity that we can create for responsibility and ownership, whether that's being the people in charge of sub-rotations, um, watering greenhouses and crops, or whether that's teaching their peers, um, those are the opportunities where knowledge and experience is really cemented and grows. Um, just a few other things I want to mention or go back to as well. Um, it's difficult in a production setting to really slow down, and yet that's a big part of what we're doing all the time. And one of the ways that we perhaps slow down the most, but then really help people solidify knowledge is through observation and reflective um, exercises where we send people out to look for and seek things with sort of open-ended questions. Um, and similarly through journal prompts, asking people open-ended questions about prior experience, current experience, new knowledge, how, uh, what they're seeing happening around them, um, and what are the influences, for example, that say maybe facilitated the germination of this particular crop or the lack of germination, um, so that people can think about how, how would I need to do things differently in the, in the future. Um, and I mentioned this idea, this drawing connections, that just really I think is pivotal for everything that we do is not isolating ideas, but bringing them, how they relate to the whole. Um, and then we have been working also more recently on this kind of ladder idea of management templates for, that relate to one crop that you could take elsewhere. So for example, um, pests and diseases that affect the brassica family. And so what are life cycles? Um, what are seasons and environmental conditions that promote pest issues? What are crop susceptibility? And then what are prevention and reaction strategies? And if you have that template to think about the brassicas, then that same idea can be used to think about the solanums or think about um, any other crop that you might be growing. And then that knowledge, people can really tailor it to their place because, as I said before, where they're not all coming from Central Coast California, they're coming from all over the world. I've got a few more questions sure. here. So uh, mm -hmm. I think we talked about this briefly, but probably should just reiterate how many new students CASAS has per year. Um, there are 39 apprentices in the six-month training program, usually about seven second-year apprentices who stay after finishing the six-month program, stay for an additional year. Um, and then undergraduates, the numbers vary a little bit from time to time, uh, exact time of year, but somewhere on the order of 20 to 35, 40 interns who are there, it, either for two-unit or five-unit internships, which means they're there for six or uh, that's six or 12 hours a week. Um, and then the practicum classes are usually somewhere between 25 and 30 students per week or per, per quarter and they and there's only one at a time and those are they're usually actually on-site engaged in hands-on learning about two hours a week and then they have another couple hours that's more um, observation reflection oriented. Great. Next question, how do you compensate outside speakers? And how do you deal with speaker fatigue? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, so I'm not personally responsible for the compensation of outside speakers. So 
I, I can paint part a partial picture there at least. Um, many speakers really like what we do and come and, and provide their knowledge and expertise for free or for very nominal fee like their travel, their mileage and cost to get here. Um, in some cases, and then people working for the university, um, extension agents and so forth, that's part, part of their work already. Um, and then um, in some cases we bring in outside speakers who are working say for nonprofit organizations who really depend on the outside uh, speaker fees that the, their staff can provide or can generate. So we are paying as little as nothing to um, 75, 50 to 75 dollars um, in some instances all the way up to 500 dollars for a, a, a day-long session. Um, the I will say, I in my experience the amount we pay is, is not directly correlated. We don't value the people's experience based on that, but it's more what they need to be able to do the work for us. Um, and then as far as speaker speaker fatigue goes, that's a challenging one. We're always trying to find new and different people um, because people do get worn out, but we try to really make it um, attractive for them to come by providing fruits and vegetables, flowers and things that are going to um, make them want to come back. And usually our audience, um, you know, seeing the motivation and inspiration of our audience is a good draw to keep people coming back as well. Great. Thank you. Well, let's, let's go back to you for a little bit and we'll hold a few more questions. Okay. Yeah, so just yeah. kind of one last point here, one or two last points. There's a bunch of many, many other things that in an hour we can't really cover, um, but I just want to point a couple things out on here. We're always trying to bring lightness, humor, the breaking of bread or sharing of food in the process. It's a great conversation starter. It's a great way to kind of um, ease tensions and so forth and really um, connect people to the work that they're doing. Um, and really trying to encourage people to go back and reflect on the, their actions and their activities and see that I did this, what happened, what do I think about that and how might I do something different in the future. Um, very often we respond to questions that people ask us with more questions um, to help them think through the process because they're not always going to be in an environment where there's a quote unquote teacher or export right there. Similarly, I have here it depends in quotes because so rare is there just such a, you know, a clear cut and dry answer. Um, or even if there is a clear cut and dry answer, is the sky blue? Yes, it's blue, but what are the influences that are making it blue? Really trying to get people to see the sort of the spectrum of things that might influence the response to their, to their question. Um, and then, yeah, I mentioned this idea of open-ended questions and then peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, we really are trying to blend the idea of theory, practice, and together in this concept of practice as well. Um, and one thing that we are working on and that um, Jan has really been helping us with is measuring success. How do we um, how do we understand what's working and what's not working? So going to our students and trying to assess their skills development, their comp competency development, so then we can refine our practices. And all of this then ties back to this idea of this is a lifelong learning journey. Nothing can, one can't become an expert in six months, but hopefully one can learn what questions to ask, what resources that are out there. Know, build a foundation of knowledge that you're going to keep building upon um, as long as you're paying attention and thinking about it. Um, and well, I think before we go, dive yeah, into yeah. this part, we've got probably about five minutes left, so maybe we can just go with our questions at this time. Yeah, and you wanna well, I just want to, you know, I will. This is, I think, a key topic for many folks, and ultimately for us, the way we view this is that growing crops is the context for growing people's skill and capacity. And I'll leave that at that so we can get to a few we questions. We can do that in our next webinar. <laughs> <laughs> so a few more questions, tips on how to not micromanage when students are owning something like irrigation. Oh, well. It's just about to go awry. And it's just about to go awry. Well, 
so letting go is probably, um, yeah, letting go is a key thing. You really want to try to set people up with um, everything that they need for success and things we do have crop failures, we do over irrigate and under irrigate things and we'll try to intervene but in kind of a kind and gentle fashion but ultimately we really want people to learn and so even when things do go awry then going back and saying okay well what happened here what do you think happened what did we need to do different um, but knowing that sometimes in a in an education setting with a bunch of learners not everything's going to be perfect and what are the typical backgrounds in terms of farming experience for your first year apprentices? And then the um, adjunct question is, would a PhD chemist be a competitive applicant? <laughs> <laughs> um, so typical backgrounds are really broad ranging, and I know we don't have much time, so I'll just say anywhere from ages, anywhere from young, early 20s to we've had a couple of folks in the last 10 years who uh, either were or turned 70 in the program. Um, and then quite a range of backgrounds from some folks who've had no college or, or um, adult education experience to folks who do have PhDs um, in molecular biology, um, in education, kind of a, across the gamut. Ultimately what we're, and, and I should say so, and then people with years of farming experience as well as people who have done only short-term stints on farms or in school gardens and so forth. And ultimately what we're looking for are people who really want to build their capacity and have a vision for the future of how our program can be a stepping stone forward. Um, and in fact a lot of people with more of an academic background, often in academic settings, practical skills are underrepresented, underemphasized, so we've actually had a lot of people with advanced degrees who come through the program because they want to, or, or people who are seeking to go to grad school who want to have that broader picture before they get into the academic realm. Great. Another question, are there resources for training recent immigrants or other populations where language or cultural barriers may need to be addressed? Um, so that's an excellent question and unfortunately that is an issue that we as a center are lacking on. We're working on um, fundraising and then the development of our two training manuals being translated into Spanish, but that's only one of many, many languages um, that farmers and, and gardeners speak in this country. And so us individually, we're, we are lacking, but um, through organizations like ATRA, um, there's a fair amount of information out there. Co-op Extension, for example, in the Central Valley here in California, um, they work with a very, very large Hmong, populate, Hmong population, and um, and yeah, that's an area that I, I actually think we need to learn more about, but we're lacking. I think there's a couple, I know, beginning farmer and rancher projects uh, that may have some information available. There's one um, that started a year or two ago that's looking specifically at immigrant, um, helping immigrant farming incubators and other groups. It's called ISED Solutions. Mm. You, Joseph, is the leader of that. Oh, right. I don't know what they have at this point, but that would be one place to look. And um, another group at uh, UC Berkeley, um, I don't know the name of the project right off the top of my head, but it's led by Jennifer Sauerwein. She's been working with a number of immigrant populations as well and may have some resources. So unfortunately, we have more questions and not enough time. So um, I will wrap it up here. And uh, it looks like, I think we had a slide to put up there. So here's some places where you can get additional resources for both CASPIS and um, CCOF. We also want to let you know about some upcoming um, educational events. Please check out CCOF's um, education page for these. There's one on Go Organic, learn about organic for this at the Small Farm Conference, and another food safety training March 29th in Fresno. So we'll post a copy of today's session on our website and we will email you um, a link to it in a few days. 
So I'll also be sending out an email to you today with a link for a survey. This is our second webinar, and we really appreciate your feedback. We'd also like to know what you want to see more of from us, so please look for that email. It will be from me, Jan Perez, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us.